Today is Tuesday, February 23rd, February 7th, 2023. <laughs> and I want to welcome everyone into your city hall. And we have um, a consultation with the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission regarding our orchard rezoning. So we're going to just jump right into there. I want to welcome all of the commissioners that are here. And um, I'll just go through and have you state your name. And I think many of you probably know most of the counselors here. Um, but we do have a new counselor. And I'll have our new newest counselor state his name. And then we'll just start over here with the commissioners and, and go from there. Uh, Andrew Dunn, Iowa City at Large. Mark Sines, Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, Mike Hinch with Planning and Zoning Commission. I've been on for eight years, been chair for five years, so awesome. I've been doing this a long time. Great, great. Maggie Elliott, Planning and Zoning. Billy Townsend, Planning and Zoning. All right. Here comes Chad. And please come <coughs> on up. All right. Welcome to all the commissioners. Super excited to have you uh, here with us. Thanks for your service. We know that it is uh, time consuming and a lot of dedicated work going to it. So we appreciate you being here today. So as we know, there was um, the topic of the orchard rezoning and um, the council wanted to just have a consultation with you all and um, I know that some of our counselors probably have some burning thoughts that they want to share. So I'll just open it up to whoever wants to begin. I'll just go ahead and start. Um, Maggie Elliott and myself were the two of, two affirmative votes for this application. Yeah. And Chad, sorry, Chad. So probably want to start off with folks that uh, were in the negative. So I Billy can, or Mark. I can start. I'm not shamed. <laughs> I was concerned about a, lot, about a lot of the affordable housing that went that, that was being taken, getting gotten rid of during this uh, whole process, um, and that there was no affordable housing uh, in this packet because it looked like they were paying the fee in lieu of. So that was getting rid of affordable housing that was accessible to uh, buses, to the downtown area, to the things that they were, that the people that were living there were accustomed to seeing that wouldn't cost them more money uh, for affordable housing. Okay. <laughs> um, I was concerned about a, a few things. Um, one of them, I think, primarily being the size of the project. Um, when we had looked at this piece of property a few years ago, uh, and looked at rezoning the Orchard District. Um, that area was kind of looked at as a transitional area between the, between the more commercial uh, area on, on Riverside and to the, to the east, and then helping transition into the Orchard District and the neighborhood there on the west. Um, and then, you know, in the time since the Riverfront Crossing District was created, um, this this group or previous groups have um, expanded uh, that area a little bit into basically crossing over Riverside. It was initially you know, limited to east of Riverside, and we've expanded that a couple times, including the latest one into the Orchard District. And you know, so one of my concerns was also, uh, are we you know how long do we continue to expand the area uh, as opposed to putting a, a, a firm limit to it? Um, another issue that came up that I, I guess I continue to have concerns about is the, the traffic impact on that area. Um, uh, in particular, the Orchard Court itself, I think it's Orchard Court, um, yes. coming out of come and go, coming out of the two large apartment buildings that are already there. Um, there's, there's one way in, one way out. Uh, and concern about uh, the traffic there, um, signalization, signalization causing more problems with the traffic, with the traffic there. Um, those were, I think, kind of the general generalities of my concerns. And just to um, give support for just at least my affirmative vote is, you know, of course traffic is an, an issue there, but those traffic studies were done by professional engineers and planning staff. 
And then I think the conditions were set for signalization and possible <laughs> turning lanes. And if traffic's heavier than anticipated, then the council will have to deal with that at the time and the, and the staff. I mean, as all development comes, traffic increases. So yeah, there's just have to wait and see if, if the impact is greater than what's set as some of the conditions. And about affordable housing, and I'm very affirmative in my support of affordable housing, but this application is in compliance with the ordinance. There's two options, either provide 10% of the housing in the units to be affordable or to pay a, a fee in lieu of, and so that is in compliance with the ordinance. And then lastly, the bulk of the buildings. It's a little overwhelming sometimes when you just see the concepts that's submitted, but we always have to keep in mind that those concepts they're, the developer is not held to those. That's just what, at this time, what they're looking to see that that finally will be reviewed in site plan review because that um, uh, it's a very common thing when we look at that to say this is what it has to be, but the rezoning can be whatever is eligible in that rezoning. Um, this would be riverfront cross crossings orchard. So. Um, those things are what led me to be in support of this. I think it's in compliance with the comprehensive plan. It's compliance with the zoning ordinances and uh, the character of the, of the neighborhood. I think it is transitional because the building can only be three stories with the top story being stepped back 10 feet. So that provides uh, a step down degradation from the building like immediately to the east, which are multi-story buildings. So it is getting smaller as we're going to the single family residences to the west. So those were my thought processes on that. And I just want to add, I just came from that area, and Riverside is one of the busier areas in Iowa City. And without that building, without those buildings, it's a heavy traffic area, even when it's not the traffic area time, like 5 o'clock when people are getting off work. So I think we have to be mindful of putting more traffic in that area uh, just for just for general use. Yeah. I'll, I'll weigh in really quick. Uh, for many of the reasons that Mike spoke about, uh, I was affirmative and supportive. Um, like Mike spoke about, um, uh, that project went from a, a single single building to multiple buildings. Um, given the rezoning uh, provides zoning, but doesn't restrain the builder to that model. Um, as long as uh, the spirit uh, remains the same in the construction with multiple buildings versus one large unit uh, that the good neighbor uh, meeting provided feedback on. Um, I was in support of it. The traffic does uh, present a challenge because of the cul-de-sac and uh, potential cut throughs on come and go and the neighboring parking uh, or the neighboring parking lot for the uh, apartment uh, location. However, um, you know, that area could use the redevelopment. It's underutilized uh, in the lot that's asked to be rezoned. And so it's an opportunity to add some additional housing there. Chad and Mike have done a good job of, of summarizing. I would just say the same thing is that there's more people, more people can live there and it's close to town. It's, um, it, it's accessible. Um, it seems like it's uh, good use. I'd rather have more people living there. It's close to town. And it, I felt it um, uh, was part, it met the criteria for the comprehensive plan. And in that vein, just my last thought was, um, of course, in riverfront crossings, we want density. And the, the objective is to get people out of their cars. And with the improvement of Riverside Drive with the pedestrian um, passageway underneath the uh, railroad bridge on the west side, I think then that those units now will be more conducive to students and just walking so people won't, frankly, when nobody would take a car to go downtown because there's no place to park if you're a student. So I think, um, it certainly encourage a pedestrian oriented um, housing. Great. Well, I, I want to say thanks to each of you for kind of sharing the, your thoughts at this time. Uh, fellow counselors, uh, certainly you can do whatever you want. I know I can't control you. Um, but what I do want to, I want to remind you that we, uh, this is on our agenda for later today. 
and people from the public will also come up and uh, sh you know talk to us and so I would just caution us on um, um, giving some firm positions if and, and waiting for the public uh, to come and share their thoughts but we do certainly have individuals here before us that you can uh, engage with and um, kind of have some dialogue with. Well, I, I was primarily interested in, in hearing your thoughts and rationale for the, the position you took on the project. And uh, I, did, I did watch the video of your, of your meeting when you discussed it. And so what, what I'm hearing is fairly consistent with that. Um, and, you know, I was also wanted to hear again your understanding of the transition, because I think the transition is really at the crux of this whole situation in that that was really the, the reason for creating the Orchard District was creating a transition. I guess I just have some questions for um, Commissioner Sines and Townsend. Thank you for your comments explaining sort of what your primary concerns were. Um, is there, so if, if there were to be redevelopment, are there kind of suggestions or thoughts that you have as far as what, what you would want to see on the affordable housing front or on the kind of the scope and the traffic front that you think would make it um, agreeable to you? Well, I don't know about that. A continuing discussion we have in the Planning and Zoning Commission is um, th the ordinance allowing the fee in lieu of, and it's just felt that that's not really doing much to address the availability of affordable housing in the Riverfront Crossings District. Um, so as a matter of fact, I think we're going to be talking about that in a future meeting if we would like to put forth a recommendation to the council to re-examine that ordinance to, because we're going to end up with a big pot of money, but no more affordable housing yet. And not only that, but what affordable housing actually is. And as we know, affordable housing right now is really not affordable for those that need it. The other, a little bit more background on my thoughts on the transition piece. We had a, we had a, a, a pr approved a plan for this property or part of this property previously. Um, and it was, I believe, in the unanimous approval at that point. And what that, what that was looking at at that time was more of a smaller townhouse style units um, and, and along Orchard Street and, and taking the turn to the west there, whatever that street's called. Um, and, uh, you know, and that, again, was, had unanimous approval with the commission at that time. Uh, and, and I saw that as appropriate scale for that transitional area. Um, and I, I see, you know, I, this plan just goes beyond that for me. Um, and uh, one of the things Mike mentioned, and I'll, I'll say Mike and I don't us usually disagree on a whole lot of things, but on this one we're pretty <laughs> firmly on opposite sides of the, of the, of the field. But um, that uh, the, one of the things that concerns me is that these are just conceptual plans and we never exactly know what's gonna happen and quite frankly, from our experience, it often at times turns into things beyond what we originally thought it was going to be. And, and so that, that has, be, I'll be honest, that has become a growing concern of mine um, in a lot of the things we look at at the commission. Uh, and so that's certainly played part of my uh, analysis of this, of this project also. So um, is it fair then, for, based on what John was just talking about is for, he saw the transitional part as being the crux and what you were talking about as well. Is it that there does not appear to be firm enough direction about what transition looks like? Can I, could I speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, in, in, our, in my conversations with, with Jeff, really what's my understanding from the comprehensive plan uh, is that we don't have a definition for what transitional is. Um, it is my understanding that that is something that we pretty much determine as a body on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, that's my understanding of things. There's no definition in state code. There's no definition, I believe, uh, in our zoning code or in our code of ordinances. Is that also 
commission's understanding? Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't think it's concretely defined. Right. Um, it's certainly something that um, in this, and I disagree with my friend here, <laughs> that I see it there since we do have the 30 foot setback, we have pedestrian walkway, we have a three story limitation with a 10 foot step back of the, the third floor. And you take that to compare then to the buildings to the east and that just visually you can see the transition from multifamily to a lesser multifamily and then into a single family dwelling. I see our city manager, Jeff Rohn, will welcome you. I just offer a point of clarification. So there, there's not a definition, so to speak, of trans, what a transitional zoning is. And I think that was the question that we discussed. We can't tell you what exactly transitional zoning is, but your zoning ordinance provides regulations that govern that um, transition. And that could look different in different zoning districts. So a transition in a commercial zone may look a little bit different than a commercial, than I'm sorry, the transition in this particular zone. But as um, Chairperson Hench was, was just commenting, the transition is governed in the regulations of the zoning code. So that is that setback, that mm -hmm. step back, the height limitations that you have. That is how we regulate that transition. But there is no specific definition and there's not uniformity in transition across the code. And I, don't, I, w I would say that's probably not something that we would um, look to have because transition between single family and multifamily may look different between um, two multifamily districts or commercial against residential. That's all going to be different and that's why it's regulated a little bit different in each of the zoning classifications. If I could ask a question about that, Jeff. Um, so w what you're saying is the, the zoning code has examples of things that could constitute transitional, right? Could constitute a transitional area or could potentially satisfy that you know, the, category, the, right? the zoning code is going to have regulations in place that attempt to create an appropriate transition. Again, that's going to be height and step backs and setbacks and things of that nature. And I think one of the challenges that we face as a commission and you all certainly face as council is is those inter making those interpretations and, and looking at those fine details and you know this is a this is a request for a rezoning this is a request to change what's there now to something else and and so um, you know we we are called upon I think as 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 public servants to you know to help make those decisions as to what we think is best you know, overall, but it, it isn't always set in stone as much as we would love it to be. <laughs> it's just not always set in stone. I wanted to just address something that uh, Commissioner Townsend said in, in regards to affordable housing. I, I know that we've had this conversation before, but um, affordable housing in our community is a challenge um, and how how is defined, I think, I know my peers here, we really want affordable housing. We need affordable housing. We know that our residents, you know, cannot afford, uh, some of them can't afford the prices that are out there. Um, and, and some of that is determined by um, what is affordable. There's, you know, thoughts that if you spend 30% or more of your um, income, then, you know, that the, the housing situation is no longer affordable. Um, w when I look at, and this isn't, you know, really getting at the heart of this, I think it's talking about the entire, because uh, I heard something about um, the, um, the fee in lieu of, as well as the affordable, um, uh, the affordable period. So sometimes we have the 20 year, affordability period and and if they were to remain in the riverfront crossing area or whatever well at the end of that 20 year now the um the developers are allowed to continue that affordable housing should they choose to do so but um I, personally i think that's going to be um not what we are going to see as a community and so where we've intentionally you know, thought we want to ensure that we have affordable housing in some of these areas, it won't be there in 20 years. Then that's where I step back and say, well, you know, 
we need a bigger conversation. I, I won't shy away from that. But in the moment when I'm looking at a specific developer, um, I personally don't like the fee in lieu of because I think experience in a place outweighs a million dollars for any one individual. If you can put a person like I'm from Chicago and uh, wasn't from the wealthiest community, but if you put me, if, if you give a person the opportunity to be in a diverse area where it's affluent, um, people sometimes mimic uh, what they see and, 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 and they can uh, you know have some greater opportunities. So I, so the fee in lieu of doesn't sit well with me, except what I will say is if this body you know, takes the fee in lieu of, more than likely what we're going to create with that will be uh, housing and perpetuity. Um, so it'll be affordable units not in that area, but somewhere else. Um, now, granted, uh, in the Riverfront Crossing area, we have, you know, we have to uh, take the fee in lieu of dollars and, and make affordable units within that area. Um, but I think, as we know, the cost of that area is going up, right? And so we may, as a body, determine that we don't want to have those, we want to move those funds out of the area, and I think we can determine that and vote on that should we choose. So I, I just wanted to give just a, I wanted to touch base on the affordable housing topic because it is a challenge. And so, you know, fee and lua for me anymore, you know, how do we get the most bang for our buck? And that is, you know, taking the fee in lieu of money, but then there are opportunities that I think someone is going to miss out on because if we take the fee in lieu of, they won't be in that area. And so it, it becomes a two-edged sword in a way. Um, but I at least wanted to acknowledge that, um, that this is an issue. I think that... Um, when we look at you know projects that come into our community, we're looking at the comp plan, we're looking at um, what's there now, what's going to be, um, and those are hard decisions. And um, I think that the, as many of you know, that the city is moving more to these form-based codes, uh, which would kind of take out the guesswork uh, on some level for P and Z, uh, developers, staff, this, um, uh, council, but more importantly, <laughs> the residents that are going to be living there and the residents that currently live in, in, the, in that surrounding area. And so um, while I don't have um, something specific where I, I don't have any questions for you all, but I just wanted to acknowledge that what you're doing is a really hard work. You're doing what we've asked of you, and I really appreciate that. Yes, uh, thank you, a Mayor. correction. Uh, no, no, not a correction. Uh, I just wanted to uh, point out that, of course, the affordable housing is a, is a crucial discussion and something that City Council has been focused on uh, for years. Um, but just to be clear, the item you're discussing tonight is yes. a specific rezoning and so forth. And as uh, Chairman Hench has mentioned, uh, this proposal does comply with the ordinance as it is today. Now, in the future, Council may choose to revisit uh, the issue of fee and lieu or any other issue related to affordable housing, but I just want to make clear both to uh, planning and zoning commissioners who are present here tonight and, of course, to council members that in deciding, as they will later tonight at the formal meeting, uh, whether or not to approve this item, it, it could be on any, any number of factors, but failure or use of, uh, or I, I should say, compliance with the present city code by using fee and lieu should not be a reason that the council should deny Ab this item. Absolutely. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. I appreciate that. I have a question, um, pivoting a little bit, and it, not for, sorry, not for you, um, about whether it's for the, uh, I have a question simply about, there was something in the notes about the potential of solar and I, on the roofs, and I don't know if that's appropriate for now or if it's something um, to wait for as a question in the formal for clarification on that. I thought there, you, you there can, had been. Uh, you can just, certainly ask staff or, okay. so I think the question is about silver. No, no, solar. Solar, solar. on the roofs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Whether I thought it was silver leaf. Given okay. <laughs> something about the density of the buildings, whether there would be solar or not. and I, So I'm just curious about whether that is um, part of the conversation. Uh, I, I don't think that we're familiar with any okay. plans for solar, but, but usually we wouldn't 
be at that level at this, of detail at, level, at a rezoning right. stage. That's something that uh, the developers would probably analyze in the design phase. So keep sure. in mind that uh, developers typically are not going to put a lot of uh, resources into design until they know that they have the regulatory approval to move forward with whatever concept they may be considering. Um, so if, if this were to be approved by the council, this rezoning were to be approved, you would expect that the developers would then invest quite a bit in the design of the building, um, probably building from that concept, but it, you could and should expect that maybe there'd be some uh, changes to the design, and that's when something like okay. solar would be be looked okay. at. I think the developers will probably have an opportunity to to speak tonight before you close the public hearing, and if they're considering solar, they could certainly let you know. Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. I think my confusion simply lay in the fact that this was an incredibly rich discussion that you guys had, and so as I was going through the minutes, I know there was a lot, so was, that's on me. It was briefly mentioned in the PNC meeting, along with charging for EV vehicles, um, but that was it, and it wasn't part of the application, and there is no possibility of bonus height, so it would have nothing to do with the height of the building. Right. Thank you. And Mayor Teague, you were asking me personally about the affordable housing piece. I, w I was more given a statement and um, agreeing the, uh, on some of the points that you made well, earlier. I guess I just want to add that, uh, and hopefully, Ann, I'm not being out of place when I talk about the uh, trailer courts that have been taken down around the, well, the Foster Road ones are now flattened. The ones on Prairie du Chien now are flattened, which were all affordable housing pieces in Iowa City. Um, and so how do those people now find housing in Iowa City? And they have all been a part of our community. Those places have been there for years. Uh, their children have gone to school in our area, and now there's no place for them that they can afford. So I just want to make that as part of uh, why I voted against. Sure. Thank you. I had some questions about the traffic. Um, I don't know if... Uh, members of PNZ or, or staff can talk either specifically or in general, but with those two intersections so close to each other, Highway 6 and Orchard Street, um, obviously the plans that have and that came before us mentioned having a traffic study and signalization and um, uh, trying to accommodate uh, that area, which is already, like the way it is now isn't exactly a perfect thing either. So in terms of like what's possible, what's sort of the standard for that kind of a close intersection is traffic flow be improved um, I don't know if I'm if I'm wording this question right but maybe you're kind of following hopefully a little bit of what I'm getting at what will be sort of the end result can you keep that from being like a crazy backup situation people trying to turn off a of highway 6 onto Benton heading west or um, you know what, what are you what, what can you help shed some light on that for me yeah good afternoon Commission Council Mayor uh, Kent Ralston transportation planner so yeah, as it stands today, um, one of the conditions of the rezoning would be uh, that a traffic signal is installed at Orchard uh, Street, Orchard Court, and, and uh, Benton Street at that intersection. So um, there was a traffic study done in one of the previous iterations, uh, which when this was Orchard Court lofts a few years back, um, that development at that, or that concept at that time had something like 130 units. Now we're up to maybe like 180 or 90. Mm -hmm. We did not require the developer to go back through the process with a new traffic study because even at that point in time, a signal was already warranted uh, and the developer is aware of that. So it's something like 50% more uh, traffic, but when you look at the actual peak hours, which is what we're most interested in, it's the matter of uh, 10 or 20 vehicles per peak hour. So we're not talking about a huge difference. Um, and therefore, we didn't have the developer go back through and uh, take the time and effort and, and money to do a new study. Oh, I see. So, so yes, at the end of the day, uh, if this moved forward, uh, a traffic signal would have to be uh, installed, um, and that would have to be installed to the city uh, engineer's satisfaction. Yep. And what the study shows, to be more clear, is that a traffic uh, signal would be able to handle that amount of traffic uh, with acceptable level of service. How does that work, just maybe in general? like? It is there a way to set the time on those so that the flow isn't, you know, uh, we think we all know what it's like when we're driving down the street and we hit all the lights wrong. Right. Um, you know, and right. so maybe, that, maybe that's traffic calming, so that might <laughs> right. not always be a bad thing. But uh, Right. Sometimes we try, sometimes we don't uh, fix those. No. It's, uh, yeah, with respect to the actual distance between the two, um, right. that's a good question. It is relatively short. It's something like 
260, 280 feet, depending on how you measure it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you actually look at other locations in town, we have some other, uh, some similar uh, distances between signals, and we would just coordinate the two, right? So they'd have to be green essentially at the same time, and we do have mechanisms to, to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts at this time? Well, I really want to appreciate the commissioners for coming on a Tuesday and uh, Thank you. spending some time with us today. Thanks again for all that you all do. Really appreciate it. And you're excused. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank yes. you, Council. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to move on to the next agenda item, which is the presentation from local mental health providers. And I see two that are going to be presenting, Sarah Nelson and Talia Meilinger. I know, that's a mouthful. Yes. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us today. We're going to breeze through. Uh, the first half of this, Talia Meidlinger, Executive Director of UAY. The first half of this, it's pretty heavy on some stats and stuff because we want to really land on what mental health looks like in our community from our boots on the ground perspective and, and kind of what we're doing um, in collaboration and partnership. So here we go. Uh, trigger warning, Sarah and I talked about this. We will be talking pretty explicitly about mental health and suicide. Um, there will be resources, of course, at the end of this presentation. Um, or bring them back down. He's on my board. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Um, anyway, so there will be resources. Make it just however is easiest. Yeah, we're good. Um, so if anyone is struggling after this conversation, our community has a lot of resources. We talked a lot also about who has knowledge of the resources that we offer and who doesn't, who has access, who's willing to access, all of that talking about stigma, stigma and, and which communities are, are comfortable engaging with our services. Um, I debated talking about the pandemic because we're all tired of it, um, <laughs> pandemic, pandemic. Um, but I think that we can't talk about mental health without talking about what's happening on the heels of the pandemic. Um, the Surgeon General said that, uh, officially stated that we have a youth mental health crisis. We know that they were struggling pre-pandemic, especially young people who belong to marginalized communities we were worried about before the pandemic. Um, and I think that what we're seeing right now is that they continue to increase in, in their level of mental health crisis. Also note that these stats are old, right? Data falls on the heels of what's happening in the here and now. And so everything that Sarah and I are going to be talking about, I can guarantee in a few years we're going to see drastic increases in the number of young people and adults in our communities who are struggling. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about is fairly generalizable to adults as well, um, but I'm just taking the youth mental health perspective because that's who I am and that's what I do. Um, Factors that can shape the mental health of young people. As a social worker, I always come at things from the biopsychosocial perspective. So we're thinking about biological, psychological, and social context in which people live and come from, right? So we're talking about society, social and economic inequalities, discrimination, racism, all of these things that we know impact how people are, how they show up, how they treat the world, and how the, tr the world treats them. Neighborhood safety, I mean, in this previous conversation, we heard us talking about what's the best way to provide affordable housing, where should it be located. Um, relationships with peers and teachers and mentors, faith, community, school, climate. What we know is that the identities we carry impact how we see ourselves, how other people see us, and how we interact with the world, and vice versa, how the world treats us. I have, right, standing before you, have had a pretty easy time interacting with the world, but I work with a lot of people every day who don't. Um, relationships with parents, peers, teachers, how are you received in community spaces? And then the individual, age, genetics, race, ethnicity, gender, all of that. I think it's so important when we talk about mental health that we understand all of these aspects of mental health and who we are. We have to understand people in the context of their lived experience in the here and now. And I think that um, to that point, 
all of us are severely undereducated about what mental health is, especially in our marginalized communities where mental health is extremely stigmatized and access is incredibly difficult to come by. Um, it's important that we shift the way that we think about it and talk about it and provide mental health services. So in 2019, right, uh, one in three high school students and half of female students reported uh, persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness, an increase of 40% from 2009. Again, these are dated statistics, and when these fall on the heels of what's happened during the pandemic, I think I'm not gonna be surprised, but it's gonna be alarming, and we have some incentive to act now to work to address this, because like I said, Sarah and I have boots on the ground, our staff have boots on the ground, and what we're seeing is a lot of people, individuals, families, communities that are struggling and honestly dying by suicide, uh, by violence, by being pushed out of systems that are, are supposed to be supporting them. So a little bit about what UAY did in the previous fiscal year with our staff, a limited staff of 30. Um, we provided 402 clients with 5,016 therapy sessions. We averaged a therapy wait list of 40 at any given time, which means young people and families are waiting one to three months to being seen. Now these are families who feel comfortable accessing formal mental health, billable therapy. You come into the office, you spill the beans to somebody you've never known, right? If we're talking about stigmatized and marginalized communities, we're talking about trans transportation, reimbursement rates for insurance, right? If you have Medicaid, not a lot of people in Iowa City accept Medicaid because it doesn't pay well. And who has Medicaid, right? Who has access to these services? Who's able to make it to an appointment during the middle of the day? All of our therapists only have one four o'clock and one five o'clock slot every single day of the week. And do you know who gets those slots? People who show up. Why? because insurance companies only pay us when people show up. And so we have to address all of the barriers we've been talking about in this room today. Um, we've done crisis intervention and mediation with 280 clients, 1,404 sessions or contacts, 355 victims. We've provided 97 crisis support groups, right? This is the informal, let's go where young people are. We call it hashtag not therapy. They're not trained therapists, but they're providing the very important social emotional support um, and social emotional learning that young people in crisis need. 425 crisis counseling sessions to 66 parents and families. And then our new Spark Engagement Program, which is aimed at targeting uh, BIPOC youth who have barriers um, to accessing services, positive pro-social activities and peer relationships. 213 youth of color, and we didn't even have that program um, for the whole fiscal year. And and then 434 LGBTQ youth. Okay, so I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly, but just looking at kind of what the stats are showing us nationally, then what we're seeing in the state and what we're kind of seeing in the county um, based on what's available for us. So <clears throat> again, these are lagging statistics. It's as quick as we can get our hands on them. But in 2020, uh, one in five U.S. adults were living with mental illness of varying degrees of severity, which means 21% of all U.S. adults. Serious mental illness, which tends to be where you're the functioning, their daily functioning is more highly impacted, is about 5.6% of all U.S. adults. Suicidal thoughts and behaviors among adults in the U.S. In 2020, there were 12.2 million adults that had serious thoughts of suicide. 3.2 million made plans for suicide and 1.2 had attempted. Firearms were the most common. Yes? I actually have a question about the last slide that you had sure. there. Um, you have the, the difference between prevalence between females and males. Um, do you have any information as to why that exists? Is that, um, do you think that there's factors having to do with stigmatization where, you know, males are just not talking about it or? Yeah, I would say, you, you know, you could speculate a lot, but my, um, this is very anecdotal, but my suspicion would be that out of the people surveyed, that females were more likely to report versus the fact that females are actually experiencing a greater level of mental health issues. That's, that's what we see on the ground. It's what we see in the suicide statistics that, that I'm about to show as well. Um, so I was saying firearms are the most common uh, method and accounted for over half of all suicide deaths in the US. 
Um, something that's important in community crisis services work and suicide prevention and intervention that we try to uh, make sure that the community understands when we're talking about firearms is it is the most, most lethal means because we have the shortest time to intervene. So from the time that we know somebody has a gun in their hand and, and death could be imminent, our ability to intervene is almost non-existent. If somebody reaches out and they've taken a bottle of pills, we can, we can intervene. We, ha we have more chance of being able to intervene. And so that's why you see that as the most deadly um, means. Uh, so overall in the U.S., suicide was the third leading cause of death for individuals between 15 and 24. And as Talia said, that is really concerning um, because this is lagging. And what we're seeing on the ground with youth mental health is that they are suffering more um, now than ever before. Uh, it, it's the second leading cause of death for individuals between 25 and 34 in the U.S., and the fourth leading cause of death for individuals between 35 and 44. In Iowa, over the past 20 years, the rate of suicide has been climbing out of proportion with the increase in the population. So over the last 20 years or so, um, the population has only gone up by 6.9%, but the rate of suicide has gone up by 89%. So in 2021, we experienced 541 deaths by suicide in Iowa compared to 286 in 2000. Johnson County, in 2021, there were 31 deaths by suicide, 27 male, four female, three youth under the age of 18. That is actually an alarming statistic. It is not common. Um, for youth adults under the age of 30, nine between the ages of 30 and 39, marking them the largest subset in Johnson County. The leading means was firearm, uh, accounting for 12 total deaths by suicide, followed by hanging, and, uh, and then a variety of other means. Uh, hanging is also something I would point out. Very, very hard when you work in suicide intervention and prevention. Means restriction is what we often refer to. How do we restrict people's access to means? Um, those two things, if we can do means restrictions with firearms, means restriction when it comes to um, death by hanging is very challenging, if not impossible, to address without someone having eyes on someone 24-7. Go ahead. Is there any sort of um, like geographic or municipal breakdown of, of where these occurred? So the Johnson County Medical Examiner may have that information, which is who provided it to me, um, and I suspect they do. So in 2022, there were also, so note um, at the time that I got this from the medical examiner, this was did not include any December data. So this is missing a month of data. Um, there were 31 deaths by suicide, 20 male, 11 female. When I talked about, um, Andrew, when you asked that question about our females reporting it more, when we see death by suicide statistics, um, more commonly males uh, complete suicide. Three youth under the age of 18 in 2022, nine under 30, eight between 30 and 39, five between 40 and 49, six between 50 and 79. Leading means was still firearm, followed by hanging. So what do we have in our community right now um, to address these concerns with mental health and suicide? Um, some of what Community Crisis Services does is operate crisis helplines. That means 988, um, Iowa Chat, University of Iowa Emotional Support Line. I am, this is a half a year of statistics, so not a full fiscal year, but July to December um, being the most recent data, we had about 39 thousand chats and texts that originated in Iowa. Um, that data is more anonymous. It can be really hard to drill down to exact locations if people don't disclose it. Um, it's part of why people use the service if they want help but want that anonymity. 706 phone calls originated in Iowa, 272 contacts on the U of I emotional support line. Uh, what we were able to pull was 50% of Iowa City chat contacts were for clients 23 or younger. That's not surprising. I think I talked about this last time when I was here that we're really seeing text and chat utilized at a much higher frequency, especially text, and that is your 15 to 24-year-old demographic um, that accesses that. 
In terms of presenting issues, anxiety and depression were the lar largest areas of concern, followed by relationship issues, school problems, self-harm, and sexuality. Mobile crisis response, July to December, we had 543 mobile crisis dispatches, 170 youth specific, 125 ICPD uh, LE liaison dispatches, 1,207 follow-up contacts with those that we've seen in crisis, average 20 minute response time in Iowa City over those six months, and a 95% diversion rate from hospitalization. Total MCR calls have increased by 35% from this same time period last year. 73% of all of our calls are from Iowa City residents. And 54% of youth MCR calls are for students in Iowa City School District. So this is something Talia and I will tag team a little bit, is we wanted to talk about how mental health challenges show up in our community. Because oftentimes what we're talking about, people don't understand that what they're seeing is mental health. And so we wanted to just touch on that a little bit because these are things that have a lot of cross-sectionality with different sectors and things that we're seeing across the community. Um, I'm a firm believer, and so is Sarah, that behavior is communication. We look at challenging behaviors with young people and community members as a behavior that needs to be addressed, not something else that's going on beneath the surface. Um, we talk about this as outward suffering, not to label it as bad behavior. Um, in the schools and in the community, we see this as fighting, disruptive behavior, agitation, disrespect. Adults use that a lot about young people who are struggling. It's a disrespect issue. And then the internalizing the silent suffering, which is what we're all a little more familiar with when we talk about mental health, reduced productivity and performance, that's talking about in the workplace as well as in the school, substance use, suicide, suicidal ideation, withdrawal and self-harm, and then the overarching umbrella that you see, I mean, all of these can of course cross over, but again, substance use, low mood, feelings of worthlessness, change in behavior, habits and friends, school refusal and self-harm. A lot of the work that we've been doing and Sarah and I talk about is that young people and adults in our community who have more externalizing behaviors are more challenging to work with and they often get penalized. They get involved in the judicial system or juvenile court. Um, they, they pick up charges, they get suspended from school and all of these things have long-term detrimental impacts on those people's ability to get where they need to be and to be well and to have the resources they need. Um, and so when we talk about thinking about mental health differently, we have to totally flip it on its head. We have to go to where people are and serve them in the areas they are. And I was, I was talking to Talia, and I think this is a good analogy to kind of help hammer this point home, but oftentimes when we talk about individuals on the autism spectrum, what you'll hear that community say is that just because I am on the higher end of the spectrum doesn't mean I experience my autism less intensely, it just means you experience it less intensely, and vice versa. And so with externalizing, we want people to understand those are mental health issues. They're harder on people, they're harder on systems to deal with, those are hurting people that have mental health issues, where those that are silent and withdrawn, they're not problematic for people. And we worry about them too because they're not problematic and they don't, might not stand out and so they're not getting the help that they need. So just realizing that all of that is mental health. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about marginalized communities who already have an inherent distrust of, of many of our systems, they're angry right, marginalized community members are more likely to have externalized behaviors because maybe the internalized stuff wasn't recognized or the internalized stuff isn't supported in the way they need it or it's stigmatized and so they externalize. So Gap, so you know, these aren't all specific to mental health but we thought, we, we see this on the ground when we respond to crisis situations and so just some of the observations of our staff, um, shelter specific to women and children is a, is a pretty significant uh, gap in this community. If it's, if it's not related to domestic violence, um, that has been a real challenge that on the ground, I can tell you anecdotally, has seemed to increase in the last year in terms of women and children showing up needing that support. Um, Non-emergent health care, such as prescriptive, 
prescription assistance. It's something um, I would love in mobile crisis if we could have some kind of uh, ally that, that can prescribe medication. Like the ability to have a prescriber on site with us to just do a script of Prozac, you know, when that's a... And not have to wait six months to get into a provider who can do a full evaluation. It would be huge, and it's something that's doable, and I think that we could do as a community. Um, services utilizing a harm reduction approach. You probably don't want to get Talia and I going on this, so I'll try to be <laughs> short. Um, but, you know, we often take this kind of punitive, like, you either, you know are abstinent or nothing, and realizing that if we meet people truly where they're at, if we have somebody that's presenting that's an alcoholic and they're willing to take that step and stop drinking vodka and switch to beer, or they're, going, they're willing to you know, make a decision about only drinking and using Uber and not getting back in their car, um, 20 yeah, million examples. 20 mil I, think, I think we have this idea about sex, drugs, and suicide. That if we talk about it in a real way and provide the real facts, that we're going to increase the likelihood that people are going to participate in those things. The reality is, if we teach young people and adults the truth about sex, drugs, and suicide, they're going to make more informed decisions, and then they have a trusted person to reach out to when they get beyond where they feel safe and reasonable. But like Sarah was saying, this, this abstinence-only, non-harm reductive approach is damaging to everyone, um, especially on the heels of the pandemic and what we're seeing evolve right now. And I, could, I, use a, I can use another example of harm reduction that you know is sometimes shocking to people. But when I oversaw the youth shelter in Cedar Rapids, and there were kids that they were going to run if they couldn't smoke cigarettes, but we didn't allow cigarettes in the youth shelter, right? And so was I more worried about them walking down the street to smoke a cigarette, or was I more worried about them running away and being sex trafficked, which is how they showed up in the, in the first place? I'm more worried about them running away and reentering sex trafficking. So we didn't need to know about it. We had a policy of you, you hide those just down the street. You want to take a walk, go, don't talk about it, don't tell others about it. But is that what we want? Ideally, no, we want them to quit smoking. But is that going to reduce the harm to that young person? Absolutely. And so I would say in Iowa in general, services that take a harm reduction approach to, to moving people along to that place where they're healthy and thriving is something we severely lack in this state and in our community. Um, access for individuals with a dual diagnosis. I do not like the term dual diagnosis because I don't even think it should be a thing. We know that if people are using substances, there's almost always mental health. Um, but what happens is when people try to access one or the other, they're kicked around um, to a different door because, oh, well, that's substance use, not mental health, and that's mental health, not substance use. And so people and families aren't getting the help that they need. Youth crisis stabilization, the number of times um, we have a suicidal young person who ends up in the emergency room for 24, 72, however many hours, maybe they get put into an inpatient bed, maybe they don't, but oftentimes they're like, I'm fine, let me go home. That we don't have any real concrete, meaningful ways to take a young person in crisis and help them get out of that and then follow up with resources after that. Uh -oh. Family support, peers, respite, navigation, and practical concrete support, right? Looking, again, understanding people in the context of their lived experience. I can't just work with this person and not address the entire unit, right, in a really meaningful, robust way because we know that generational trauma, poverty, racism, historical trauma, all of that stuff follows people, right? And it's not just one kid who's the problem or one adult who's the problem. It's an entire system that needs the support to get out of it. And we try as hard as we can, but we're also severely understaffed to do that in a meaningful way. Um, again, here's the funding for non-traditional and non-billable approaches to mental health. We have a number of grants that allow us to do some of this, but we can't just grow more therapists. That's not the solution. We're not gonna like, here's 4,000 extra therapists, Iowa City, but the people who have a stigma about mental health are still not going to access it. The people who don't have private insurance probably are going to be on longer wait lists, right? And those folks need services now, immediately, in spaces that feel comfortable to them, in spaces that they trust. Um, and then the provider shortage and skilled workforce. I have a number of people on my staff who are not trained therapists, 
but their, experience, their lived experience and the cultural relevance of where they're coming from and who they're communicating with goes far beyond what an hour a week of billable therapy will do for the people they interact with and their entire family unit. And so we have to think about differently how we define mental health. Now, I don't want to be able to all willy-nilly like anybody can call themselves a therapist, right? There's danger in that. And so that was a fear that happened some, some years back. But I think we can think differently about lovingly intervention. about interventions. Mm -hmm. Hashtag not therapy can get you as far as you need to go until you're ready for therapy. Again, mental health disparities, low barrier access. All we talk about all the time, we're gonna have to step off our soap, soapbox <laughs> soon here, I get it. Um, but these go hand in hand, right? Provider discrimination, we're talking about folks who don't take Medicaid. I get it, I'm a provider. I don't take Medicaid, why? Because it doesn't reimburse, and that's my side hustle, guys. Um, lack of professionals who belong to marginalized communities. I don't wanna talk to somebody who doesn't hold my very same marginalized identity. Lack of access to quality care, right? Inadequate health insurance, again, talking about Medicaid or having an incredibly high copay, the number of clients we see who come in who do have. Blue Cross, they're like, I can't afford a $60 copay for my kid every week, I'm barely paying my bills. Stigma surrounding mental health, I'm not crazy, it's fine, I just, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, the historical trauma piece, mistrust of systems, especially healthcare systems, and awareness of mental health and what it means. Like I said, I think that we are severely under um, educated on what mental health looks like, sounds like, feels like for all of us. And this slide is just because I wanted to make sure that we had a resource piece after we talked about all of these uh, heavy topics, but how to access services at UAY, mobile crisis, 988 for phone or text, crisis chat, um, community food bank and financial support, DVIP, um, domestic violence intervention program, shelter house, and RVAP, rape victim advocacy program are all um, wonderful services in our community that um, help to address some of these intersectional things. And lastly, any questions you have for us? I have a really tough question that I'm almost sure you can't answer when you talked about all the gaps. Do you have any sense of the scope of what it would take as far as funding if we imagined a world in which those gaps were filled? could but it would be a project <laughs> mm -hmm. i mean there is an answer for that mm -hmm. but yes it's not something that would be answerable on the spot i think you know what talia mentioned in terms of things that are non-billable that those really are the gaps i mean when you look at a service like mobile crisis that is a non-billable service and that is a gap filler that mm -hmm. is what catches all the people that are waiting four months to get into therapy or you know that so when you a lot of the things that we need as solutions are more innovative and out of the box than insurance will allow mm -hmm. for us to actually have the impact um, so it, the number could be arrived at but it would definitely be a project mm -hmm. I've got a question about um, something that wasn't talked about quite too much in this presentation, but I'm, I'm still interested in hearing your uh, your take. Um, you know, a lot of seniors in the community and, and just around the, the country um, also deal with this in a very serious way. Uh, incidences of suicidality increase, uh, you know, as you get older, just due to what happens, um, you know, what happens to your body, your friends, all that type of stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm curious as, as to what you guys see in the gaps of care for you know, seniors in our community, in our county, um, as well as if you think that a lot of the resources, which are very virtual or, or using, uh, you know, a phone are, are sufficient uh, at this time, or if there needs to be, you know, a more hands-on approach with, with some of our seniors that are struggling. That, that's a really good question, and it, I instantly went. Um, so I would say that's a population. Mobile crisis is an excellent service for that population, right? We can come in person. It does not require technology. You do not have to be savvy. You just have to be able to pick up the phone. It might be a little bit confusing, but compared to other services, pretty mm -hmm. easily accessible. That said, the outreach to that community looks different than outreach. Um, and one of the things when we added the youth 
mobile crisis program coordinator, and I've talked to Delhi about this a lot. Um, having an individual going out into the community, building relationship with each and every school, going to different family practitioners, therapists' office, that has increased why we're seeing so many youth in mobile crisis. There is no number of pamphlets or radio spots or billboards that would have had that outcome. So when funders invest in people for outreach, they often don't want to. It doesn't feel that impactful. And so it's almost exciting to me to have a really concrete example of this. Like this is how many youth we saw before we had somebody dedicated to this outreach and look now. Mm -hmm. I suspect if we had someone doing that, that that is what their sole focus was um, to build bridges between seniors and mobile crisis and other services, we'd see those numbers grow because that, that's it, it, those. That's how you reach people is by building that relationship and that trust. Yeah, I was going to say relationship-focused interactions where you can come and present, and if I'm struggling, I say I talked to somebody from that agency and I remembered that and it felt good. I can trust that I can go reach out to them because it might feel similar to what this presentation or this engagement looked like and felt like. I think a lot of people are hesitant to call because they're anxious, right, or access, access services because I don't know how to do it and I'm, I'm already depressed or anxious or have no motivation. Why would I also now make this call? Oh, wait, but I remember what that relationship felt like when we talked. I guess with, with regard to that, do you think that there is, um, is the time ripe or, you know, are, is the setting ripe for, um, you know, us to develop some of the uh, services that you have that are, you know, group-based, you know, your peers uh, helping out um, with, with our seniors in our community, you know, trying to get folks that might be in a, a better place with their mental health to be there for those who, who may not. Is that something that you think would be um, more beneficial, or do you think that there might be some large barriers to achieving that? Um, well, the university has a, a program that people can go to become certified as a peer support specialist. So if they've experienced those challenges themselves and they want to go and get that certification, um, so that's an, that's an option um, when you're talking about peer support. Um, but I do think... Uh, I think getting targeting, we are in a good place and it's important right now to target resources at making sure that seniors in our community understand what's available to them. We know um, that population experienced dramatically more loss during the pandemic than probably any other population. Um, and so I think that making sure that we're reaching out and making those connections so that people are aware. and and I feel like I say this every time I have the opportunity, but when it comes to mobile crisis and crisis helplines, and I'm sure Talia has programs that she would use as an example as well, like those are accessible to anyone in the community. It does not matter your socioeconomic status, it does not matter your insurance, and it's not available to you any other way. It doesn't matter how much money you make, you cannot get a service that's gonna show up at your house in less than 60 minutes. And so making sure that everybody in our community understands this is for you, this is for everyone, um, it helps with the stigma busting, um, but people that don't tend to access a lot of services also tend not to know about certain services that might be really beneficial and are available to them. And it's that, again, relationship building. I do not think the answer is a marketing piece. I think it's a lot of pounding the pavement and building relationship to make people aware. Do you have, do you have, um so in, in present state, the, um, the capacity to do the kind of outreach that, you know, that, that UAY and you as a partnership have done, because I'm thinking about, we've got trail and we have, I mean, thinking along the, the lines of the senior piece, but, but in general, we have so many agencies where they could be sort of partnering or helping spread that word about community as well as like the peer training. Pro I'm just thinking about ways because I recognize this is also a capacity issue. Um, 
I think Mayor Teague brought it up last time when I was speaking about seniors, and I thought I left that meeting thinking, man, that's another thing I've got to focus on because it was such a good point. And so, specific to seniors, the short answer is no. We don't have the current capacity to do that. Like, I can tell you all the wonderful things right now that we could do to reach out to seniors, but I can't tell you what staff I would have available right. to do it's, that. Yeah. And I think until there's the resources to build a framework, right, encouraging people, like do the peer support training, do that, it's really helpful. And if you don't have a structure in place to support that, um, you're relying on people who voluntarily want to do a thing to, to improve the, the mental health outcomes for our community. The numbers you've given for the youth, and particularly the pe teenage, fif like 15 to 18, is extremely distressing and alarming, and I'm sure as it is to you too. Um, you mentioned, briefly said uh, something about the schools. Is there currently any sort of partnership or outreach into the schools that lets, the, lets these troubled children know that there's someone or something they can they can do besides like the parents forcing them to to go to counseling and, and those kinds of things is there a support system in the schools currently yeah all of all of our staff are pretty like daily in and out of all of the dis district buildings and providing those non-traditional supports to students um, but again it's capacity right we we only have so many staff people and how many thousands of kids in the school district who really really need the support and that's the same, I, I think, I've been tooting this for a long time about counselors and that's sort of a misconception. And, and from what I've heard from the school district, now, you know, counselors probably have like, are responsible for 300 something students or even more. And it really isn't a counseling sort of task. It's more like getting them on track to uh, what they're going to do after high school. But actually having someone to sit down and pour their heart out to, they're just, there's not the resources, yeah. and that's hard. That that must be you're really in a rock and a hard place there. Well, and the counselors are great. They have the training to provide similar support, and I think it's about recognizing how much stuff we put on people's plates. You're going to be in charge of academics and college planning and who gets to know their counselors. A lot of the young people that we interact with are like, my counselor, who's that and what do they do and how do I find them and what do I talk to them about? I don't know. Um, so again, it's that counselors have such a, a broad spectrum of things that they're expected to do and to also then be like, also, do you have time to be an expert on men youth mental health and, and impacting that? <clears throat> they should know it, but right, let's have other people who have that as their job doing that work. On the capacity side, um, I think I'm understanding that the outreach leads to more use of the service. So kind of looking at the, the back side of that, what is the capacity as far as the ability to actually go out, like specifically mobile crisis, is it scaling fast enough to meet the need as the outreach increases, or just kind of where where is that now? Where do you see that going? I'm, uh, fiscal year 24 is going to be a very complicated year to budget, I would say, because I'm we're seeing a lot of growth. I want to make sure that mobile crisis remains accessible. We no longer can hire on-call contingent mobile crisis counselors. The model that we used to use for whatever reason. Um, after COVID, people do not like to be hired on an on-call basis. And that, I mean, that was the model I used at Foundation 2 and Community for six years without any issue. And both agencies are saying the same thing. We have to hire full-time mobile crisis counselors or we can't fill these positions. Well, mm -hmm. if I want to have two te three teams of two ready to respond between nine and five, that's six FTEs that I need per shift, three shifts a day to run 24 seven. So that's significantly more than what I have right now. And that's what I'm always shooting to have is two to three shifts available. Cause if we get a call, we don't need that overnight, but if we get a call at five, a call at six, a call at seven, we have to have three teams available or the wait times are gonna be long. And it's a firehouse model, right? There might be a lot of crisis that day, and there might not. And we don't we don't know until until it's it's there. Um, but with that outreach, I mean, definitely that outreach in our school response. I mean, just on Monday, we were in five different schools. Hmm. It was not like that two years ago. Um, so the outreach definitely. And now we've hired a second youth specific 
counselor because it's grown so much. So that person just started two weeks ago because our one coordinator could not handle the scope. And that was in less than a year of that being rolled out. Any more comments by counselors before we move on to the next agenda item? Other than to say thank you for the work that you're doing and thank you for this presentation. This was really important information. Thank you guys thank for you. your interest in mental health and your support of it as always. Appreciate it. And yeah, feel free so to reach out if there's anything else we can help with. And thanks to all the staff that you all. They're amazing. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. It was good to see Community Crisis Services and UAY here today. So thanks to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we are going to move on to the next agenda item, which is presentation of the annual historic preservation report. And welcome. Thank you, Mayor. I'm having troubles here, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't get that to go at all. Thank you, Council. I am Jessica Bristow. I am the Historic Preservation Planner for the city. Uh, Iowa City is a certified local government. Uh, the Certified Local Government Program was established in 1980 and Iowa City joined in 1983. It was part of the amendments to the 1966 Historic Preservation Act. It encourages historic preservation at the local level. It encourages local governments to use the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. And it also provides technical assistance through what we call SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, and it provides funding opportunities for preservation activities. Every year, SHPO requires an annual report, and it's a calendar year basis, and it's also required to deliver it, deliver it to council, so I'll have about five minutes or so. One important thing to note is that a lot of historic preservation is based on the National Register of Historic Places, so the national designation of historic properties. The Certified Local Government Program deals with the National Register pro uh, properties, but also any locally designated properties. The CLG program in Iowa is one of the most active CLG programs in the country. In Iowa City, as you might know, we have both National Register designated properties and locally designated properties. This map happens to be a map that we provide in letters to property owners uh, each year, and it shows all of our historic districts and conservation districts. Historic districts are also listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Conservation districts are only a local designation. In addition to these districts in the map, there are also two, lo uh, two National Register listed uh, districts in Iowa City that do not have a local component, the Melrose Historic District and our new downtown historic district. We also have 66 uh, local landmarks that are designated. About 45 of those are listed in the National Register. There's also quite a number of um, National Register landmarks that are not locally designated. This is personally my favorite map because it shows all of our districts plus all the little red dots are local landmarks that are designated in Iowa City. Part of the report includes just general information, such as the fact that we have 12 seats on our commission, nine of them are filled, the three that are not are small districts that are very hard to fill, and so we've had those open uh, pretty regularly. Our budget is mostly from the Department of Neighborhood Development Services, but we include a little bit for our annual mailing and some training. And then, of course, we have our Historic Preservation Fund. It started in fiscal year uh, 2017, 2018, uh, with $40,000, and it was increased to $42,000 this past year. In the report, the first thing that the state has us do is talk about National Register listed properties, and it has us list properties that were altered, moved, or demolished in the calendar year. We really look at altered. 
we uh, review um, applications for alter alterations to properties. And so those are the ones that we uh, talk about here. Um, there were 36 of our National Register listed properties that were altered in some way during the calendar year. This does not include what we give as a certificate of no material effect because it doesn't alter the property. Uh, this one happens to be 623 Oakland in our Longfellow uh, Historic District, and they added a screen porch on the back and did a little bit of associated uh, window changing. The next thing that the report does is have us talk about our local program. And the first question is whether or not we designated any local uh, landmarks this year, and we did. We had the 937 East Davenport, the John and Anna of Rocktiki Pribble Cottage. It was built in 1874. At that point, it had a family of four living in it for a while. <laughs> and then they had two additions that were put on the back, both before 1920 that you can see there. So then, like the National Register question, they ask a question about locally designated properties that are not on the National Register that have been altered. And uh, we have about 25 properties that were altered beyond a certificate of no material effect in our conservation districts or local landmarks. This ha happens to be one of them. Uh, in our Goosetown Horace Mann Conservation District, they had approval to remove their synthetic siding and repair the uh, siding and trim underneath that, and uh, it looks spectacular. It's at 426 Church Street. Uh, one of the sections also talks about the assistance that we as uh, staff and commission provide uh, for historic preservation projects within the community. Um, we include in this part of the report our review data. We had 89 applications for historic review in 2022. That's out of 246 inquiries about individual properties during the same year. This is down just slightly from 2021, which is the highest year we've ever had, but it's pretty much just right in line with what we had in 2020, which was a little bit more than 2019. Um, our, our greatest benefit and assistance that we can provide is our Historic Preservation Fund. We provide $5,000 matching grants or no interest loans to property owners. To date, there have been 43 projects on 36 different properties. This happens to be one example. They, it's 422 Grant Street in the Longfellow District. They had a deck approved to be replaced. The contractor removed the deck and found basically the sill plate and the studs were rotted out and it's because somebody didn't flash properly and so we help them with the fund to repair that part of their house and then they'll go on later and build their deck with their their own funds uh, the report also includes public education and outreach. This year, uh, we had our Historic Preservation Awards. Um, it was the 39th annual, so I can tell you that the commission and I are very excited about this coming year because it is our 40th annual. Uh, so we'll have to come up with something exciting for that. Uh, we didn't really have much more uh, education and outreach this year. We've done more in previous years. And then there's a sec section on um, issues, challenges, or successes. Uh, the fund increase is great because it allows us to just accept more uh, projects right away. Um, challenges, the open positions on the commission has been a challenge. We've sent mailings targeted. We've, we've tried a lot to get new commissioners. They must live within that historic district. Um, so students are great in some of those rentals, but we still do have problems getting commissioners. And the lack of available contractors. This is a nationwide pro pro problem, not just within Iowa City, but um, getting contractors who know historic buildings and can work on them is, is a problem. So um, anyway, that, that's the end. Um, again, I'm Jessica Bristow, if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank really you. Really appreciate you coming. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful transitions here thank you all right we're gonna I'm gonna, just gonna ask for USG to come up at this time um, before we continue with our agenda so as the University of Iowa student government welcome hi council 
All right, so we just have uh, two announcements today, the first being Town Hall. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing you all at 7 p.m. this Thursday for Town Hall. Uh, it will be a great way for the City Council and undergraduate student government to connect and discuss a variety of topics. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Noah and me. And then uh, our other announcement is the University of Iowa's Graduate Student Union, COGS, has been protesting and continuing to protest in preparation for the union meeting with the Board of Regents, uh, where they hope to negotiate for a 10% wa wage increase in paid parental leave. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Can you note, I'm sorry, just very quickly, um, remind me of the location of the town hall. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's going to be located in the old Capitol Senate chambers, so that's on the second floor. There should be someone directing you to there. When are, when are COGS negotiating? Uh, I don't know the exact date, sorry. It's, it's very recent here. I want, I want to say within a couple weeks here yeah. at least. Great. Thank you both. Great. All right, we're going to move to item four, which is the continuation of our fiscal year 2024 budget discussions. Uh, Mayor, there's a memo in your packet that responds to uh, a couple of requests that you had at your last work session. There was an interest in uh, potentially adding some outreach positions um, to accelerate action in your strategic plan, as well as a uh, grants position to uh, uh, allow the city to more aggressively pursue some of the new federal grant programs uh, that are expected to roll out in the coming years. So that summary is there. Um, as much as we try when we present the budget to give you a clear picture, uh, it is anything but clear at this time. Uh, you've been tracking the uh, conversations on Des Moines that um, are kind of, I'd like to say, kind of twofold. There's the immediate rollback issue, which we've, we've talked about, whether they're exploring that fix. That could have a $1.7 million uh, impact on the budget proposal that was delivered to you in December. And uh, the second piece is more of the overarching property tax reform. And we have competing proposals that have been introduced in the House and Senate, neither of which have, have garnered a lot of attention to date. But we fully expect they both will garner quite a bit of attention uh, in the coming <laughs> weeks and months uh, while session is still in. And we really have no idea how that will affect uh, future budgets going forward. So unfortunately, I don't have that clarity. Um, but hopefully, the memo gives you some uh, good information to continue your discussion, and I will happily uh, do my best to answer questions for you. Real quick question. Have they already changed some of the deadlines that we're operating under? I know that was one part of the discussion early on. <clears throat> uh, the Senate, uh, in passing Senate File 181, which is that rollback correction, did extend the budget deadline um, uh, into April. Um, however, that is currently on the House side of things, and that uh, has not fully passed. I believe there's a House committee on that legislation uh, tomorrow, and I don't think anybody would be surprised to see that fly through committee and show up on the debate calendar either this week or very early next week. Uh, the reason I ask is uh, I'm looking at some of, uh, and thank you uh, for the detailed information uh, that you put in the packet. Um, but, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I, for one, am, am, um, would like to see us uh, be able to do something with some of these positions that we've discussed. Uh, but I also understand that the commitment in trying to balance those two things, I'm wondering what the time frame is we have when we have answers to some of these. There's so many question marks. And so, so I, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, I'd love to keep pushing forward on these, me personally. Um, but I also recognize, you know, so that's what I was wondering about the about the date shuffling. Yeah, I think that it's going to be hard. I mean, maybe by your next meeting, we'll we'll know uh, if if the dates have been officially extended. Um, the, the one piece of one thing you can keep in mind, if you authorize positions in the budget, we will account for those expenses in the budget. <laughs> Uh, but oftentimes when it comes to um, r reducing expenses mid-year, we'll leave positions open, unfilled. Um, we had to do that during COVID. We had a number of positions that we didn't fill because of the immediate uncertainty around the financial situations uh, in early 2020. 
Um, so I, I fully would expect that you'd have this caution, and that's what I articulated in the, in, in the budget. I have that same caution. Um, one option would be for you to direct us to authorize the positions in the budget, uh, but just understand that uh, as we move closer to that July 1st date, we may have to analyze not only those positions that you create, but, but positions across the city that come open, uh, depending on what type of legislation passes in Des Moines. And just to put a little finer point on that, Jeff, I think in your memo, the estimates that you give for the cost is assuming that they'd be hired July 1st and, and would serve the full fiscal year. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Okay. I personally feel that we should move forward with the positions. I, I understand um, the hesitancy, of course. Um, but as it, you know, we're probably going to have to, depending on situations, look at some of those open positions at some point and determine what we're going to do with them. The other thing is, I'm reminded that you know when positions aren't filled, um, you know those are monies that we kind of bank um, with within our budget because we allocate full year positions and funding for full years so I feel comfortable um, if you if you will taking that risk that we'll be able to fund these successfully on um, their critical their needed positions and I think moving forward and giving that direction is probably critical for the staff to hear that from this council and just to piggyback on that I think that there is a, a timeliness t for both of these positions given uh, the the grant manager, the grant writer, um, as well as the community outreach, uh, especially in light of what our, um, one of our presenters was, you know, the, the, um, the importance of community outreach and um, I think is, is going to be really important. So in both cases, uh, I, I echo the mayor that um, if we can remain prudent, but think about this in terms of the timeliness of this, these are not positions just of course, they would be good to have all of the time, but I do think that at this particular juncture, it would be very good to have them, so. I agree with um, Mayor Pro Tem Alter, because I think, you know, with the, our strategic values uh, right in front of us here, that position just fits into all of those categories. And from what we're hearing in, out in the community, uh, it's really necessary, and it's going to help with housing and neighborhoods. It's going to help with safety and well-being and uh, equity and justice and human rights and, and all of those things, and, I, uh, and be a community impact. So I just think it's really important for us to keep on top of it and make it important. Yeah, I just I echo what my colleagues are saying and agree that we should move forward. Um, I'm grateful for the way that this was framed in the memo, and you know Jeff and I had had some longer conversations about where, particularly the outreach folks, should be sort of situated and how how that could work. And I'm I'm really pleased with kind of where we landed with that full time human rights uh, position. I think that would um, help fill some other gaps that we've previously identified, and that's really exciting. Actually segues into my other question I had really nicely. Um, just wanted to like, get some more details on what a human rights um, engagement specialist, what that actually, uh, a little more details on what that is or is being conceptualized as. Yeah, I think, I think we'll, we'll take some time over the next few months to really focus in on that question. Um, it's not a position that was, um, um, has been fully fleshed out, right? If we're going to hire another firefighter, we know what that job description is, and we can be ready to go the next day. This is a this is a brand new position, and so we'll probably want to research some other cities and see how they're using human rights staff. Um, but um, the, it, right now, you have a, a two-person human rights team, and they do quite a bit for for just the two of them. And one really focuses on the the. Um, uh, complaints of discrimination and, and, and really looking at those um, those situations. And then uh, Stephanie, who you're most familiar with, uh, might be before you at a council meeting, uh, manages not only the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and human rights responsibilities, but all that programming that you see in the community. Um, we do a lot of web-based programs. We do a lot of in-person based programs. And right now, that's that's largely falls on Stephanie's shoulders with the assistance of, of an intern. And uh, I 
think an engagement person just helps us take that to the next level. Um, I like to use the climate action team that we have as a good example. That's a three-person team, and you've really been able to see since we've filled that um, that 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 full team. Uh, and that was one of the areas in COVID that we held back on um, filling. But now that we have a three-person team in climate action, you see all kinds of outreach. You see neighborhood blitzes. You see the climate fest, so larger, larger events. Uh, you see a lot of um, uh, kind of short, sweet um, uh, social media engagements. Uh, we're just able to do a, quite a bit more and reach people through a lot of different means. When you are limited with staff, you 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 tend to find um, uh, one or two areas that you can just continue to replicate, um, and this will just allow us to do a lot more. I know Stephanie has some some ideas. Um, we've talked about um, really uh, trying to get into neighborhoods and build um, um, confidence in people to be able to step up and serve on a border commission. You know, right? How do we tear down those barriers that are, might be preventing someone from saying, I, I want to participate in the local government process? So talked about maybe an academy uh, where we can really walk people through what local government is here in Iowa City and how they can participate. Uh, that would be one example. Great. Thank you. Any other discussions related to budget? And it does sound like majority is in support of moving forward. I'm seeing that with those positions, okay. Here and no other top, uh, here, here and no other discussion on the 24, fiscal 24 budget. Then we're gonna go on to clarification of agenda items. Or nothing there. Well, right. maybe just to comment on the clarification of the agenda itself. I love the new yes. way that it <laughs> is on the internet and in yeah. the packet. Thank yeah. you. Yes. <laughs> the t I like that. Yeah, it's, it's clear. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I have a very basic question. Um, am I remembering correctly that the bulleted list of pending upcoming topics, potential topics, that that's a prioritized list? No. No. Okay. No, it's not. Okay. No. And that's good. If there's no questions on the agenda items, maybe we can jump in. Sorry. We're going to jump into to info, information packets. Okay. Sorry. I hopped in too quick, but. It's okay. I can, yeah. I can elaborate on what I put forward here. Yeah. So we'll, we're going to go in order of the info sure. packets. So we're going to start with January 12th. Just like to mention that the um, Joint Emergency Communication Services. Uh, Association, or JEC as we call it, uh, submitted their annual report to us. Uh, and that uh, uh, Councillor Taylor's been serving on that board, and Councillor Burgess will be joining that board uh, going forward. Information packet January 19th. 19th. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, actually, I believe it is IP9 on the draft minutes of the ad hoc uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission that my understanding is that they have, that staff has been working to get contracts out to the individual, to the different folks. Yes. Uh, where are we at in, where is staff at in the process? Yeah, so the, um Five consultants? Are we at five? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it may be more than that. Okay. We're, the, the proposal included a number of organizations um, and um, scopes that were designed to work together in concert. Um, they fell short quite, quite a bit. There was a lot of questions unanswered for us as we have to put together detailed scopes of services for, for the actual uh, legal agreements. So uh, earlier in January, we sent a, a list of clarifying questions uh, to all of the uh, all of the consultants uh, we got responses back um, late in the day on Friday close to end of business on Friday and we're evaluating those but our our intent is to 
um, develop the, the five or more consultant agreements that will have to be developed in order to accomplish this, present those back to the TRC so that they have an understanding um, of, of what they're recommending to you. Uh, after we've gone through these these clarifications and then assuming uh, continued support from the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, we'd, we'd present those to you. Just for clarification about the, how many entities are present and so forth, you may recall that there's, you know, Kearns and West and Think Peace and um, three Native Partners and uh, Healing Partners. Healing Partners includes two entities, Esteeg and uh, Eastern Iowa Mediation. We asked for the legal entity for the three native partners, and they indicated that they didn't have one. They would want to just set aside money for each of the three partners, and so we would be sending to individuals. Presumably, that would mean three contracts, or at least one contract with three signatures with them. Um, there, there's a lot there going on. It sounds like really fun legal drafting, actually, uh, Eric. Yeah. Do you know when that part might get to the commission? No. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know how far we want to dig into this topic right now, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're going to need to go back to, uh, I mean, I think the next step is going back to um, the TRC and saying, all right, this appears to be the structure. We've got all these separate entities, none of whom is willing to be the kind of prime, whoops, and that's the part if, if I had, you know, two cents to offer here, it would be, you know, normally we're used to dealing with a prime contractor whose subcontracts get all the work done, so we have one single contact. We don't have that here. Um, you know, they uh, would like to put uh, much of that work on some city staff um, that is yet to be identified, how that would work. Um, and um, so we need to kind of make sure that we, staff, and the TRC are on the same page about what they want, how they want to see it achieved, and then once we come to that understanding, then we could, you know, draft some contracts that, you know, actualize that, which will, of course, come back to you folks for your approval as well. Anything else from January 19th? January 26th. IP2 is that uh, long-term debt disclosure report, which I think is just a fantastic companion to your budget detailed reading. So I would encourage folks, if they didn't dig in on that, it's mm -hmm. just such good information. You just made our finance staff's day. That was <laughs> very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on to February 2nd in IP6. So we'll have our city manager take us away on that. Yeah, so I, I took some liberties here, and, and if I did anything that you want to unwind, I will certainly help you uh, do that. But um, coming off the strategic plan, I thought it would be good um, for, for staff to identify so that you know the items that we think will require um, some, some council deliberation before s uh, significant early progress could be made. So what I did is I went through the strategic plan and um, I, uh, I, I added those items. They are not in any priority order. I think they're probably in page order of your strategic plan. Um, <clears throat> I did forget one, and I will, uh, I will add that in future updates to this, but the, the Dodge Street two-way conversion, I think we want to get with you on that planning piece early um, and make sure that, that, that you have an understanding of how we're going to evaluate that and, and, that, and, and we can look at that. So you, can see, you'll, you will see that in future editions. Um, but again, these are, these are ones in which we feel like we need your input. It does not mean that we're ready for those discussions uh, on all of those. We still need to kind of talk through that as a group at these meetings. Um, but if you see something in there um, that you're anxious to have a discussion on, we, we'll do our best to, to prioritize those. Um, for the other topics that aren't specific action items on your plan, I just put those in a different category. That doesn't mean they don't relate to the plans. They just means that they're not specifically articulated in your your plan. So this was my attempt to just kind of get you to um, s keep that plan in front of you, keep that focus in front of you, um, and uh, consider that when you're thinking about adding other topics to the to the pending list. If you back up to the memo that precedes the new pending list, I did um, list f 
um, excuse me, five bullets uh, in there. Those are the items that I removed. Um, if you'd like to see any of those back in, we certainly can. I just felt that they were either encompassed by other items um, or it's been on there for a year or more and we just haven't had movement on it. Um, but again, uh, happy to add those back in um, if you'd like to see those in. I just had a question. What is the long-term planning work group? Um, that just refers to our in um, our urban planning staff. So at some time, we were thinking we wanted to s s um, come before you and just kind of list out, here's all the things that we've been asked to do. Here's the stuff that staff d um, uh, uh, has identified on our own that need to be done. So you could think of it as, uh, for additional form-based codes, uh, comp plan district updates, uh, code, code changes for climate action, code changes for affordable housing. You know, we've got a laundry list of things that we would like to do when it comes to analyzing the zoning code and the comprehensive plan. But as we've talked about, we only have uh, enough staff to tackle a few of those at any given time. So um, that is something that at one time we were going to come to you and say, here's how staffs prioritize this work. Here's, here's kind of the list that we're going down. Um, with the bullet three on your, on your um, strategic plan, that's the whole update of the comprehensive plan and then followed by a zoning code, we felt all of that prioritization would probably get wrapped up into that discussion. Um, I have a question basically, I don't know, to everyone, council and to, to you, Jeff. Um, under other topics, we do have the ICC SD request for the um, preschool initiative, and I know that there's a sense of urgency from uh, IC SSD, ICC SD, sorry. Um, and I'm just wondering if it makes sense to figure out a time so that we can have, a, and we've talked about having a conversation with them, having some representatives come in, and that's definitely something that given the kind of calendar that they've been looking at, it would be great if we could do that sometime soon. Yeah, so um, I've, I've offered the 21st to the school district. This is kind of late in the day, so we're Friday. Just waiting on we had a conversation, so okay. um, I'm waiting to hear back if that awesome. will work for whoever they're going to have present uh, to you. us. Um, and then another, it's sort of a PS or an addendum to, um, since the, the updates for ARPA are on there. Um, actually, Councilor Burgess and I were talking about um, ARPA dollars that might be going towards climate action. And I was asking, I said, I'm honestly having a, a blank screen moment and not remembering what kind of initiatives. And she said they hadn't really been fully developed. And so um, there could be an opportunity for us to discuss um, the use of ARPA dollars for climate action, um, specifically, um, actually, rather than owning and maintaining e-bikes, I'm sorry, I'm just like blurting this out, so it's just up to, to think about, not to discuss, right? Um, but that we would be able to potentially use vouchers. So I just would like to have that put up onto everybody's radar since we do have a timeline on that too. Not as urgent as the school district and, and their desires, but we do need to spend ARPA dollars by you know, a certain time. So I just put that out there as a pending topic. Okay. So generally the rule of, of thumb has been that if you wanna to add to the pending list, you have to have three, three council colleagues to, to, to do that um, and that's where you all kind of create yeah. this list and then ultimately well, you control tell you the what, schedule. If no one is, if you don't want to answer right yet, <laughs> yeah. think about it and let me know. Uh, uh, so we're talking about having a, a discussion of how to spend our climate action yeah. bucket. That would be best way. I think that should be on the list and could be coordinated with a staff, you know, when staff is at the point of having those recommendations, that's when we're nailing that down. Yeah. I would agree. If I could throw out another uh, topic that I'd love, and this is actually more short term than long term, but for the next, our next work session, I have some concerns over some HCDC d recent decisions on legacy agency funding um, that I would love to see on our work session for discussion at our next meeting. Um, if there are at least a couple other counselors that would be amenable to that. Yeah, I would, I would support that. I would agree with that. Okay. 
Did we get four? Sorry. <laughs> I think so. Okay. Did we get four? I don't want to. I, I saw John, Pauline, and Sean. I may have missed a fourth. Sorry. Yeah. We need four. Andrew? To get on the work session? Uh, yeah. You have three. To get four. Oh. Uh, three. Three. I think you it's three. Can, yeah, we typically do three or four, but I, I think you can make it with three. Okay. I think the rules we adopted said three. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. We'll, we'll certainly add it then. Okay. One one thing on the the list of the items that were deleted from the previous pending list that I wanted to mention was on the first item. Um, there was some to, that one had a couple of issues associated with it, but the the plan for the equitable distribution of destination parks concept uh, within easy and safe distance of all residences. You know, I think we're making great progress on our new development. Our new development is really focused on in, in making sure that that kind of um, access to open spaces are integrated into our plans. This, this was something that I had been concerned with, and it really relates to existing neighborhoods where no such destination parks exist, and exploring ways in which we could try to, to, to achieve that level of access it was, it was identified in the parks master plan. Uh, there were certain areas that were identified as being deficient in terms of, uh, on kind of a social equity basis, uh, park access. So I'm still concerned about that. I mean, there are, there are neighborhoods in Iowa City, existing neighborhoods, uh, which don't have gathering, central gathering places. And if, in my mind, that's, you know, as we're seeing with the new development, uh, kind of a foundational element. And that's great. You know, I, love, I love to see the parks incorporated. I love to see the traffic circles being incorporated on our street designs for safety. But in our existing neighborhoods, in a sense, when we create these opportunities in the newer neighborhoods, we're, create, we're, creating, we're reinforcing the inequities of those existing neighborhoods which don't have them because there are now new neighbor neighborhoods which you know, have, have incorporated them. So I don't know, I'm, not, I'm really would like to see that still in there, uh, at least having a response, you know, looking at the city in terms of where we see gaps and at least deciding what, if anything, we can do about it. I'd, I'd be in favor of that. Yeah, I think that's uh, yeah. We'll add that first bullet back in. Do you, does the council still want the rubberized surfacing piece I don't, of that? That's, that's, I think we can. So we can that. take out that first piece and just start with develop strategies? Okay, seeing a few head nods. Okay. Yep. Anything else? We're going to save council updates on the sign boards, commissions, and committees. Um, you'll be able to add that on when you give your updates at the end of the formal meeting. Other than that, we are recessing. <laughs> oh, I don't know if we intend to come back. Well, I'm sorry. Oh, did you intend to come yeah, back? Oh, we'll, I'm yeah, sorry. No, no, no. Council updates. Got it. Yes. Okay, yes. Sorry. No. So we are adjourned. <laughs>